I am finally back uh, talking here about Ansible. Last year I talked about chaos engineering, but I'm back to the origin. And uh, somehow this talk is really like a kind of continuation of the talk that I did back in 2017. And the idea is really like to tell you something about my personal experience with Ansible, some caveats we found, and like how we kind of work around is, and also give you some ideas for the future. Uh, well, unfortunately, the tool on the left like is without head. But yeah, the idea is really like that. I mean, Ansible is really like this is the Ansible. It, it's the most top. It's really quiet. And the idea really of this talk is see how you can really like have a real tool, like really like fast and, and like kind of strong <coughs> and 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 it's really like this quiet tool. I mean, when you have medium infrastructure, maybe too quiet and take too long of your time. And that's why the purpose of this talk is really like seeing how to put the bull and constant steroids. I, I work for PowerDNS. I do mainly like DevOps, site reliability engineering things. And uh, if uh, you don't know what is PowerDNS, PowerDNS is an open source DNS implementation. Uh, it's part of Open Exchange, the company I work for uh, since uh, uh, 2015. I joined one year after uh, the acquisition. And the code is mainly in C++. I take care uh, of uh, an ecosystem that is slightly larger than the open source one, uh, and it's our commercial solution, and it's written in Lua, Python, Golem, so it's like kind of microservices thing. Uh, personally, I am in charge of all the automation, which is for us part of the product, so we deliver automation to our customer as part of the product with licenses and these kind of things, actually bricks to build their own delivery and implementation of our solution. And we use Ansible a lot uh, in multiple stages of, our, of the life cycle of our product, from the <coughs> testing, quality assurance, to the rollout of the customer, the customer deployment. So why Ansible? Why really like we pick Ansible and we decided to stick with the tool? And the, the thing really is Ansible is simple, okay? This is really like an incredibly valuable property. Because for us, we are not the only consumer of the automation, but actually the real consumer is our customer. Uh, they are the one that will maintain the DNS infrastructure, and it's pretty critical DNS, as you can imagine, using our automation. So uh, it's super important to have a simple tool, okay? Because they need to understand what they are doing. We know, because we have the vendor. And for us, it's been incredibly effective also internally, because when I started doing Ansible in Power, DNS I was alone. Now we have a team of six people, and this is growing because the product is taking, let's say, is, is becoming successful on the market. And it was valuable for us because, you know, when you, when you develop lots of things, documentation never keep up. And having, like, the best practices in quality playbook is super great when you need to onboard new team members, when you need to train customers, because it's there, it's our quality in the playbook, playbook best operational practice. And also for us, like, we work with telcos. These are super complex environment. Having automation has been fundamental for us in order to speed up the delivery of, of software and speed up project delivery in this specific environment. The other thing that as a vendor is super great of Ansible is that it allows us to standardize the deployment. All the deployment look like the same. That means that for our the support team, is super, super easy to understand what is going on because it's one flavor of infrastructure. It changed the size, it's changing tiny bits, but in the end it's one single idea, one single deployment in kind of how this is made and what is the shape. Also, we work not on our infrastructure, but are the customer using the tool and having very few requirements, like in terms of software to be installed on the machine, is great because Ansible just requires Python that is shipped by default with Linux and SSH. No master, no certificates, no agent. It's very, very easy in companies that are starting, let's say, to use automation now on DNS infrastructure because it's like the thing that is there since 20 years and nobody touched to use uh, Ansible because you don't need to put many requirements. They are already scared by changing the NS software. So you don't, you don't have a lot of other end of new things that come with your solution. So, so what? So what's really the problem with Ansible? And the, the thing is that standard, I mean, one average deployment of our solution in a telco is more or less more or less look like this. It's not a big deployment, to be fair. So I work with larger infrastructure. But 
is DNS, so for DNS seeing this number may seem strange, but the idea is that we have like just 160 VMs, five data center, like one bastion host. Well, I mean, it's, it's okay. 80 rows, so not that much. 50 plays, plays are essentially, let's say, like what, how you execute things against the infrastructure, You're so you map off to rows, and I have 832 tasks. So, okay, I mean, it's quite a, some YAML code, but in the end, the infrastructure is not that big. Okay, it's not really like that large. We have only five data center. For DNS, it's normal to have like this tiny pop, but we don't have that many. There are customers that have more actually. But this is one, one idea of a reference deployment. This is like uh, like 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 how it looks like the infrastructure is not really like is not really telling you anything. But the idea is that you know we we abuse the good thing of Ansible is that you can abuse the inventor in order to like organize very well your infrastructure in groups, host, and the great thing are the groups. So you see that we have many groups and slightly more um, host a lot of dependencies between them. But really, the problem is that running our Ansible, like if we really want to end run all the playbook against this infrastructure to take ages. We made a lot of fun as DevOps like of uh, developer like waiting for their code to compile. We call C++. Compiling power DNS take a while. But then suddenly the infrastructure begins to look the same thing. Okay, like compiling and civil running. And then you can go out, take coffee, like talk to your friends for two hours and you come back and it's still running. Okay. Also one, one drawback of having long running uh, automation is that if there is an error, you are distracted. You cannot look at the error log like for two hours. And, and you get distracted and you miss the error and then tracing back the error requires like grabbing on the Ansible log or a lot of like extra tools. So it's not good having a tool that takes a lot to apply a configuration change. So really the idea of this talk is really like to try to, to explain you like our journey into optimizing Ansible execution for us. Uh, we will start from very simple and basic things. I trust everyone using Ansible is doing, and then we will get into different topics that are also, re I mean, related to the internals of Ansible. And really, the the first thing is, of course, we, we couldn't test, let's say, in in such a big environment. We we have a QA environment where every time we start with the release cycle of our software, we start, let's say, testing Ansible and the software together to see how these make the infrastructure converge, if there are problems with the integration in this kind of thing. So the reference will be this environment. So this is only 9 VMs, so very little. Uh, we have one bastion host, the same things. I mean, the roles and plays are the same because it's the QA, looks like the same thing as the customer environment, it's just little. And then we are using Ansible 2.6.14. Ansible 2.7 is changing slightly some things, but I mean, Ansible is really an upstream first project, so I, I usually never run the latest version of Ansible, especially when you need to support customer and run it in infrastructure where it, if you have side effect that might be impacting a lot of things. So this is the latest release we're using of Ansible right now. Um, you know like in Ansible there is this Ansible config thing, so we are starting here like basically with the default thing, so like we just don't do host uh, key checking because like it's a QA environment, so you know, it's, it's a one to automate it, you, you end up with problem with the SSH uh, keys. And, and the first thing really that I want to tell you is Ansible became really better. Nowadays it's really good at providing information on how much it's taking to execute and expose a lot of information now. In, at the very beginning, when I started using Ansible, it was a nightmare. It was time, playbook command, and, and then like look at the result. Uh, now it's becoming very better, and if you want to understand what in your uh, Ansible execution is taking long to be computed, what are the slow tasks, uh, I really recommend you to turn on this timer and profile task uh, callback. Uh, that really um, time, every time, how much like Sorry for the for the clash of words, but time, uh, how long each single task is taking to execute. Okay, so this is really like giving you a good indication of where to start to understand why your playbook are so so slow. The output of this command is essentially this one. Unfortunately, I cut the, the the single let's say kind of uh, execution of each single uh, task. But the idea essentially you have like. Uh, um, the, the important thing is this one, okay? We don't care about the individual one. I, I can comment, but really the point is 
you get like the top slowest task to be executed, okay? We, we have uh, 840 tasks, so you cannot list everything. Again, it's a lot of noise. So you get only the slowest one, and then you get like the, the number of minutes it takes the total execution of the playbook, okay? So our starting point was really like with the slowest one, and I can tell you where I think if I remember correctly, 86 seconds, the RC slow configuration, this is slow because there is a lot of ginger involved, and then we, we do a lot of in string manipulation. <coughs> But also there are some unexpected things. A lot of uh, actually one thing I forgot to tell you is that this is an infrastructure already provisioned, so Ansible is doing nothing. Okay, so instead of like because we wanted to sample our execution of Ansible, not how long the network is taking to download the packets. Okay, so this is Ansible on a on an already perfectly installed environment, and unexpectedly, packages that should be already present, all these packages does are taking ages to compute, and we will get to the why. And, and of course, like then there are like some copy thing, and the copy thing, of course, might be related to the fact that the network might be slow to copy the stuff. But really, like, the first important things to focus on is Ginger slow. Some installing packages is taking some time, and then yeah, and then yeah, these these are the first thing. And in total, like nine hosts, 59 minutes. This is ages. I mean, uh, it's horrible. And yeah, so this was our starting point. Okay, so. Uh, it became better, like and we will see it in the talk. So really the first thing I, I, I want to mention is, I, I can give you an idea, running this in production on all these hosts was taking the check mode uh, on all the infrastructure was taking five hour, power and a half. Okay, with a better SSH connection than the one we were using here, but five hour and a half. Okay, unacceptable. Uh, so some, some trigger first step, like really like first improvement we did. The first thing is really this one. So you've seen that the packages were very slow to be installed. Many people loop, so the thing here, they loop other packages to be installed. Loop in Ansible are super expensive, okay? Because that means that each iteration of the loop, Ansible needs to re-execute the model with a new hardware. Okay, this is unfortunately how Ansible works because you loop the model. If you notice, also the syntax is telling you this. So you you are looping the execution of the past package model. So that means that Ansible every time like copy the package model and execute it remotely in the host with as an argument the item evaluated that run. So you have a lot of round trips doing this thing. What, what I discovered is not not that many people know that the package and pip command actually accept as an argument the list. That means that it's a single round trip, okay? And, and that improves a lot of things for us. So already this, because we installed many packages, we have a complex distributed architecture. So this improves already like a single, a really simple thing, improve a lot of uh, performances for us. So avoid unnecessary loops. Check the documentation is not always clear, but every time you have a loop on something, like try to see if there is a better way to do it, like just giving to the argument the list. <coughs> Other thing, everyone does it, luckily. There are some side effects, uh, tax and limits. Tax and limits are very, very, very important because tax and limits allow you like to do selective execution of things. So uh, the goal for us was really like, we were also trying to improve the check mode thing. Uh, so checking across all the infrastructure if it was everything okay. Because when you start abusing tag and limit, you might end up in some hosts that are not at the final state of configuration. Specifically, again, if you have other teams that are operating your automation, they might forget about one tag, they might forget about something. So for us, it was important to improve the check mode execution because it was allowing us to spot misconfiguration early. But use, use really like tags to select the play, for instance, easily select the play, so the part of the configuration to be executed. Use limit to roll out, for instance, to increment the rollout of things. These are all stuff we do. Um, and yeah, one best practice, put in Chrome, like test that your check mode doesn't have any side effect and then Chrome the check mode because when you start using like abusing target limits, you might forget about one host, okay? You can easily do it, there are very nice tools, we use OpenStack ARA. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with ARA, it's basically putting the result of the Ansible execution in a database and then it's providing you a nice HTML report. 
So it's very visually very easy to understand, let's say, what, which host and for what thing are not aligned, okay? In a HTML report, so everyone can consume it. Because looking at the ANSI Bologna is a nightmare. You see, change it one in check mode, but then it's very hard to understand uh, what is not configured. So this is the way we work. So we deliver things that way. Uh, the customer have a, have a round book in which they know when they need to perform an operation, which tag they need to execute, on which host so to do running update. But then also we run always in a cron job uh, Ansible across all the fleet of host with ARA to get a record of what is not aligned. Okay. We don't use Tower yet. Um, I have some problems with Tower, really like from the architectural point of view. Uh, I don't think Tower is helping a lot with this problem of the performances. So that's why we don't use Tower. And I think the simple solution so of uh, Ansible and a simple Python plugin to be installed, because this is what ARA is, is what is working fine for us. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is essentially Visually, how uh, like some some plays look to us. So, like what I was saying, like we use Doug to to select select the, the playbook, the play we execute. Okay, this is a common uh, usage of of of, of uh, tags. We don't tag an inter interesting thing. We don't tag in the roles like part of the configuration, like install versus configure, because at our scale there is no value. Okay, of doing it, because we are fo we really focus on configuring RC slot in the right way across all the ops. If we do one piece of our syslog, like the installation of the our syslog package or the configuration, it doesn't matter for us, okay, in our case, because it's not what is giving us benefit, and it's also increasing complexity, okay? So we just use start for selecting the play. Um, the other thing, really, that is super important is uh, use cache of fact. Ansible is super slow at fetching fact. Okay, very, 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 very super slow. And, and also, like, the fact is that Ansible, by default, at every play execution, fetch the, fetch the fact. Okay, it's fetching fact at every play. We have, like, 50 plays. So that means that 50 times Ansible, by default, is fetching fact, okay, in our playbook. Even if it's not needed. But it's doing it, just because the default, okay? So, uh, that because the default is this implicit mode of fetching fact, which is making everything slow, I mean super slow, because if you run it across all the hosts, the first play that is on all will already connect to all the fact, to all the machine to fetch the fact. So why do you need to do it at the next one? Nothing is changed, it's a sequential execution, no filter, nothing. Um, there is another mode that is not the default and is smart. And smart is works in a, in a smart way, okay? So the idea of smart is that it's fetch fact only for us that have not yet been discovered, okay, by Ansible. I think this should be the default. I don't know why it is not, because this is improving performances a lot. Because, because of smart, the smart strategy, the first play, that is the one that we have below, install the repository in the kernel configuration, we already connect to all the hosts. So we'll already, Ansible will already have discovered in this execution all the fact of all the hosts. So it won't, at the second play, it won't execute anymore the, the fact. Yeah. And the fact cache only for the run, I mean. Yeah, by default, the fact are, we'll get to that. So by default, in, in Ansible, fact are cached in memory. So that means that they live only for the run. We, we get into the configuration we use, we, we cache uh, fact on this, okay? Um, and this is really this last point. So fact caching is a must have, okay? You really need to cache fact. The default strategy is uh, caching this, uh, the fact caching strategy is in memory. That means that the fact live until the end of the execution of the playbook. If you run it again, we'll fetch again the fact. This JSON file, and this is the strategy we use. We use the JSON file essentially is dumping in the not Ansible cache, like a JSON representation of all the fact of the infrastructure. That means that the next run, it will reuse this one. And then there is a TTL for this cache, which is this one. And, and you can configure the TTL you want, depending on how much your infrastructure change. And we, we use that value, but you can pick the one you want. So that means that even this is not, let's say, after the first execution, two hours after, Ansible won't fetch anymore the fact because the cache is still valid, okay? So this is another good thing, and is our use case of running Ansible in Chrome. This is if you if you if you like if you start caching fact locally on this, you need to add like a kind of meta play 
that is allowing you to force the refresh of the part. If for whatever reason something changes, like your touch and network interface on the machine, uh, the cache won't have visibility of this network interface. interface. So you need that to have like this task where gather fact is set to true. So that means that you have tell Ansible no matter what is the strategy for, for caching the fact or fetching the fact, always gather the fact. And that means that what we do every time we change something to the infrastructure, we, the guy, run uh, the Ansible with the tag fact so that the local cache is refreshed. So it's a way to force the refresh of the local cache. Okay? Um, this improved, so the, this three improvements, so the con Ansible configuration that you see here, so the local cache and the strategy is marked, okay? Already improved performances to us significantly because the run now takes 15 minutes less. 15 minutes is already like a big improvement. And this is also including like the optimization to the packages I described uh, below, uh, uh, before, okay? So like, instead of looping over packages installation, just, just like let Ansible loop. And as you see, like, these are sorted by uh, execution time. The, the install filter modus packages was on the top, now it's going down, okay? Okay, uh, and I can show you. Unfortunately, we don't have the time, but if you look where it was before, there were like some installs above in this in this in this uh, list of slow um, uh, tasks, and now these are going down. So we still have like the Jinja thing that is taking ages, but it's very hard. There are ways to improve Jinja, but makes like very complicated the execution. So we didn't went that way. Okay, so 15 minutes less. The second thing is that we said is that Ansible is using using a lot SSH, okay? And this is the, the thing we like of an Ansible in the end. We don't need to manage a CA, even if Puppet now is doing it automatically, because it's, it's, you, you manage already SSH authentication as part of your user lifecycle management, okay? Uh, even if I see really weird things uh, with Ansible, like with root permission with a single key on all the host, but Still, like, it's nice. In principle, it is very nice because it's plug and play, okay? Just a Python package. But you need to tune SSH. SSH is not like a super cheap protocol, okay? Because there is the negotiation of and the authentication. If you have, like, many keys, it's taking a lot of time because your, your server needs to, to check a lot of things. If you have a lot of keys locally, it also takes a lot of time because the Ansible agent tries all the, all the kind of keys on the host to authenticate with all the things. So SSH needs to be tuned a little bit. and and before getting to that, unfortunately, here is missing another piece, but I can explain to you. I want really to explain you how Ansible works internally. One thing I like of Ansible is that it's very, since Ansible 2, it's very, very easy to read the source code. Okay, so you have the inventory. The inventory gets loaded into a class that is the playbook executor. The playbook executor populates like a task queue. Okay, and then essentially the strategy that is like the way you execute the, the each thing that is what is sorting in this task queue, the, the task essentially, okay? What is telling you how you proceed, how you move on, what is the next task? <coughs> and the play iterator together, like, uh, control what are the worker processes that are on top on the right. The worker processes, there is a configuration parameter which is the fork that is uh, setting the level of concurrency of the worker processes. And then there is the task executor that is what is executing the module against the infrastructure, okay? Very quickly. And the SSH is between the task executor and the host, okay? By default, Ansible, like, ship with, I think, some same default for SSH because it uses control master and control persist. So you use SSH connection multiplexing. So it's not that every time you connect to a host, there is, like, a negotiation of the SSH connectivity. But the, connecti the connection is, sh is uh, cached for 60 seconds. Depending really on how many machines and how many tasks you run, this is good default, but you can increase it, okay? And, and reduce the number of times this, this, this control connection is not anymore present, and you need to redo all the SSH stuff. Okay, this is one, one of the first things. The second thing is the fork value, as I mentioned. The, the level of concurrency of Ansible is five by default, okay? So you have five, five task runner by default. And fork, the fork value control the number of uh, par the parallelism of Ansible. If you have a bastion host that is dedicated by running Ansible, you can really like overload it with Ansible execution. So you can increase the concurrency 
value because then your iteration, so your loop, will become faster. As well, you will be able to connect in parallel to more hosts. So when you have 160, this is like getting you a lot of benefit. Okay? Because otherwise, your level of parallelism to the connection to the host is capped by the fork value. Okay? That's really important. So uh, setting a big fork number will result, of course, in a more CPU load, but who cares? Okay? It is really like this is the thing. So adapt the fork value to the size of your environment. Okay? Don't live with the default. The other thing is pipelining. Ansible is pretty naive in the way it, ex it executes um, um, it, its models against the infrastructure because essentially what happens is that there are six steps. The generation of this Python blob, which is essentially the module plus the argument, then the, and this is local. Then this get, there are some check on remote host on directories, user home, and this kind of stuff, and these are all SSH rounding. Okay? Then at the fourth step, the code is uh, copied to the remote host via SFTP. After that, the code is executed over SSH, so there is an SSH command to run with Python this blob, okay? And then you get, like, from the standard output of this Python script, the, the output of the execution. Six uh, operation, four of which over SSH, just, just to execute a single task on a single host, okay? A lot of SSH things. That's also why connection multiplexing is useful. There is a mode that is called pipelining that I really suggest you to explore that allows to reduce this one, uh, essentially like using pipes. I need to run. Using pipes, okay? So there are some drawbacks when you use, when you have required TTI on your suders because you cannot do, use it, but it's very, very useful. This is the configuration we run here, so the one before plus this nip. 425 because even if we have only nine hosts, so we are not going to use everything. Increase the con uh, control persist pipelining through from 30 something minutes, 35 minutes to 36 minutes. So, nine minutes less. This already improved the execution a lot. Ch uh, changing strategy. I, I mentioned that there is this concept of strategy that is deciding how, how essentially you run your play, your task against the host. The default strategy is serial. Serial that means that before moving to the next task, you wait for all these the current tasks being completed on all the hosts. So if you have 160 hosts, you wait for all these 160 hosts to, to have completed the current task to move to the next one. Okay. There is another strategy that is shipped by default with Ansible, which is the free. That means that uh, once a host finishes a task, it can get to the next one, even if the other host have not yet finished the previous task. Okay, so it's a free execution. There are some problems with the free execution when you have dependencies between host on the execution of some task. So it might be getting very, 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 very complicated to, to trace down problem and make sure your, the correctness of your playbook. So we didn't pick any change here because for us it's really important to have a predictable behavior. And free is not predictable because you cannot predict who is going to be faster, okay? But this is an option, depends on you. Uh, and you can also set it per play, okay? So in each single play you can, you can set it. I want to have five minutes here for Mitogen because Mitogen is great and I want to show you oops, sorry. <laughs> I want to show you the result. Uh, Mitogen is what solved our problem uh, our problem completely. Mitogen is a Python library that was used to use like this bio uh, um, I mean bioinformatic way of orchestrating like any self-replicating program in a distributed architecture. There is a connector, uh, an implementation of uh, my Mitogen for Ansible, and Mitogen is doing something very, very, very smart that is essentially doing this thing. It's providing like a layer and module runtime, so um, a connection layer and a module runtime that are alternative to the one shipped by default. It uses a lot of the memory, so everything, instead of copying to file system all this blob in Python, everything is loaded in memory. And it uses a lot of the pipe of command, the concept of piping command from the control host to the remote uh, node over, over a pipe, okay, over SSH. It run caching of everything. So if you have already copied a module to the target host, you don't copy it again. It's just the RAM in memory, okay? If I've already copied the packages module, you, I don't have to copy again this block, okay? So in RAM caching, this is what improves a lot of the performances. This is how you install mod, uh, Pythogen. This is how you configure it on your host in the Ansible CFG. Okay, this, and it's not really relevant. This will be public. 
This is how much it takes with Metagen to run all the thing. Five minutes. Okay? Okay? So this is really like this in memory and this avoiding copy of the same thing because when you run everything you will have like the copy or uh, module everywhere. You will have the template module everywhere. What is the only changing is the argument. Okay? That way Metogen is really super fast. Okay? Five minutes over 59 that was like the default in, in S. So really, like, the thing it really is, uh, we were at the very beginning a lot of reluctant to change things around the default because we were concerned of is it going to work or not. But the point is really, like, don't waste your days waiting for Ansible to complete. Okay, don't be shy of experimenting. Okay, try to experiment and find the right spot during it. There are defaults, but it might not be the best thing for your infrastructure. Okay, uh, and really the idea is put your Ansible. On steroids, so don't give up with optimizing it because time is key, okay? It's important. There are some very useful links around, so there are other people that talk about similar arguments, uh, and there are a lot of information. Ansible documentation is not great at all, mm. but but there is a vibrant community now, and, and this, this, these challenges with Ansible are popping up, and there are people trying to solve this problem. So explore, don't give up with, the, with like something that is super slow. Don't, don't go back like, to weird things. Ansible is easy. This is the strong point of Ansible. Okay? So don't give up on performances. There are solutions. The last one is my talk on testing Ansible that I did like, in 2007. Thank you.